turn our attention again in the reading of God's Word, this time in the New Testament, to the Gospel of Luke, where we come to the first chapter. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, and we'll read a portion of this opening chapter. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. And they had no child, because that Elizabeth was barren, and both were now well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. The angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. Many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. He shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zacharias said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife be well stricken in years. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel, and stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings. Behold, thou shalt be dumb, and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. The people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. It came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me, in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. When she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. 
Therefore also that holy thing that shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste, into a city of Judah, and entered into the house of Zacharias, and saluted Elizabeth. It came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost, and she spake out with a loud voice, and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed, and there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord. My spirit hath rejoiced in the God, in God my Savior. He hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden, for behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name, and his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent away. He hath sent empty away. And he hath hope in his, his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. And as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. We'll stop there. God bless the reading of his holy and inspired word. Please turn with me in your Bibles to the prophet Daniel, chapter 6. We'll return to where we left off last week, Daniel chapter 6, picking up again at verse 10. We'll consider verses 10 to 28, Daniel 6, verses 10 to 28. The glory of the living and the true God is displayed marvelously in his grace. And that grace comes to us, is displayed to us in the most unexpected ways. God is unlike the evil imaginations of our hearts, unlike the vanity of the gods of this world. He is, his ways are higher than our ways. He uses means and men that would be least expected. And he sets forth his glory by showing one grand reversal after another. He is a God who loves the grand reversal. Joseph's brothers intended him evil to rid the world of their brother. And yet God intended good through the mystery of his providence. Their evil act brought about the salvation of Jacob and his household, the preservation of that patriarch's family. This is seen preeminently in the cross where the Son of God is crucified. A crucified Messiah through those very means, bringing about the destruction of the devil and of hell and of death and of sin and securing the completed redemption of God's people. We're reminded all through the Bible and we've been reminded all through Daniel that God loves the grand reversal, that God loves to do the last expected thing, that God comes in reverse, as it were, 
into circumstances in order to set forth the splendor of his grace. We've seen him again and again and again. This is the God of Abraham. This is the God of Elijah. This God of Daniel, who has again and again brought about these great works, bringing good out of evil. And so we, we begin this chapter with what? We begin the chapter with Daniel in a place of persecution. Daniel's being persecuted. But we end the chapter how? In verse 28. The chapter ends with Daniel prospered from persecuted to prospered. It looks as if, once again, the lights are out on God's people, only for there to be brought about a great deliverance and a display of God's great grace. God's ways are not our ways. The sooner we understand that, the better. The deeper we understand that, the better. God's ways are not our ways. He will work through means that you would least expect to bring about the greatest displays of his grace and thus of his glory. And so we see something in the passage before us about of the God of Daniel. That's how he's described, for example, in verse 26, and fear before the God of Daniel. I said last week that the the, the most significant thing about chapter 6 is not deliverance from the lion's den. It's where all the fanfare and attention is placed. The greatest miracle of this chapter is that Daniel continued to persevere in prayer. But there's something greater than that, and that, of course, is God himself. And it is God who is being set on display before Darius and Egypt and Daniel, and thanks be to his name, before us this evening. The God of heaven is being set before us in the passage that we take up. So let's consider together three things. First of all, depending on this God of Daniel, depending on the Lord. Verses 10 and 11. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled down upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Now, we covered verse 10 last week, and I spoke in some detail about the nature of prayer and a lot of things about that. We won't rehearse all of those details. The bulk of our attention was given there. But what I do want to do is underline the expression of dependence that we see displayed here. For Daniel to have thrown away prayer would have been equivalent to Daniel throwing away his life. In an attempt to save his life by dispensing with prayer, he would have lost his life, soul and body, as it were. There's a priority given to prayer in the life of every Christian. And why is that? Why is prayer such a priority? Well, there are lots of reasons. We highlighted some of them last week. But one of the reasons is conscience conscious dependence upon God. Why do we pray? Because we are conscious of our dependence upon God. Why do we not pray? Because we are not conscious of our dependence upon God. We are self-confident and therefore neglect, as it were, the secret place. But living before God with a sense of dependence upon him will make us a prayerful people, a people who prioritize public prayer, private prayer, family prayer, but especially secret prayer, like we see with Daniel in this passage. We will prize it because we are living, as it were, leaning upon our beloved Daniel is more dependent now than ever. How would it be possible for him to give up prayer? 
given the edict that has been passed, he needs the Lord more than ever. So to be cut off from the Lord would be to cut off from everything. And so it's not just, as it were, the discipline of daily devotion. There is a discipline to daily devotion. He, as he did aforetime, three times a day, as with David, morning, noon, and night, he gave himself to the discipline of prayer. But it's not just the discipline of daily devotion. There's a relationship that is born with God behind that devotion. Imagine the absurdity of someone coming and saying, you are not allowed to speak to your spouse or, in the case of children, to your siblings or your parents for 30 days. You're going to live in the same house with them. You're going to sit at the same table with them. You're going to operate in the same arena as them, but you're not allowed to speak with them. You'd say, that is absurd. How can a man go 30 days without speaking to his wife or a wife to speaking to her husband? There's a relationship that has to be sustained. It's the same with the Christian. Behind the discipline of prayer is a relationship, a walk with the Lord. The thought of 30 days without speaking to him is utterly absurd. The thought of going a day without speaking to him ought to be absurd. You know, I've, I've pondered in reflecting upon this. What would the effect of this ban, the ban of Darius, be upon 21st century Christendom in America? Would it even register? I wonder if in 21st century America, despite all the hoopla about prayer in public schools and other nonsense, that people spend attention. I'm not saying there's nonsense praying in school. We ought to be praying everywhere. But the, the attention given there, if only half as much attention were given to the preservation of secret prayer, we would not be living in the dark ages spiritually here in America. This would not be a day of spiritual degradation, would it? One wonders. You see, this is dependence upon the Lord. Do you walk with God? Do you walk with God? How is it that you can say you walk with God and yet are not habitually speaking to him. You receive mercies. How can you not return thanks in the flux of the day? You sin. How can you not bring repentance in the flux of the day? You have needs. How can those needs not be borne up before the Lord above all in the course of the day? The events of life draw out our hearts in prayer. And so, in many ways, rather than coming to the text and saying, how is it that Daniel prayed despite this edict? The real question is, how would it be even possible for Daniel not to pray with any edict or threat to sever him from the source of his life? No, if one can imagine Daniel thinking to himself, if I'm going to die, then I'm going to die looking to my Savior. If they're going to take my life, it will be with my voice and eyes and soul fixed in heaven. But there's more than that, as I noted last week in passing. If I'm going to die, I'm going to do so pursuing Zion's good. Windows are open to Jerusalem. I've already unpacked the theological significance of that in connection with Solomon's prayer last week. He is going to die pursuing Zion's good. He's, he's dying with the Lord's song, Psalm 137, in his mouth, as it were. Remember, he, he hasn't been asked to do blatant idolatry like his three friends, 
prostrate yourself before an image. He's only being asked in the world's mind to omit for a time one act of worship to the living and true God. But no, Daniel will not. He has, as we'll see when we get to Daniel 9, he studied the prophet Jeremiah. He's read the writings. He knows chapter 25. He knows chapter 29. Daniel knows that exile's almost over. He knows his prophecy. He knows his providence and history. He's counted the days. He knows that the exile is coming to a close. And you would think that would exert even more pressure. I'm almost there. I've lived all this time. You know, should I throw it all away and die right before exile happens? But instead, he sends a, he's sent to prayer for Jerusalem, for Zion, even on his deathbed, as it were. You can go to the graveyard surrounding the ruins of St. Andrew's Cathedral on the east coast of Scotland. And as many of you know, Samuel Rutherford is buried there, and next to him, Thomas Halliburton. There's a long inscription on the gravestone of, of Samuel Rutherford. In the middle of that inscription, my favorite phrase, it says, for Zion's king and Zion's cause. That's what I want my life to be. For Zion's king and Zion's cause. It should be the title of a book. This is, this is where Daniel is. His heart, if he's going down, He's going down pleading for blessing upon Zion. And all of the past faithfulness that he has exemplified in his life has prepared him for the present, for present faithfulness before the Lord. My friends, we do not just pray when we feel like it. We don't just pray when we're moved to pray. Just like we don't eat when we feel like eating, you know, there are times when we're, you need to eat the most when you feel the least like eating it. I can tell you from personal experience, I've gone weeks in recent history, months, without ever feeling like eating. You eat because it is what sustains and strengthens you. You don't just eat when you feel like it. We don't just pray, as it were, when we feel moved. We pray because our very life depends upon it. We're depending. It's an expression of our dependence upon the Lord. And so we are to be those who are given to prayer. Do you understand how loaded that phrase is? To be given to prayer. That, that ought to be our life. Daniel knew that he had more power with God and man on his knees than he did in the king's palace, in the king's council chamber, among the judges, in the senate hall. He had far more power with God and man on his knees before that open window than he ever did in his political positions. And so we find him depending upon the Lord. Make sure we hit that before we pass from verse 10. Secondly, he is delivered to destruction, verses 12 to 18. He's delivered to destruction. Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within 30 days, save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true according to the law of Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Then answered they and said before the king, That Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. And the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. And these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and Persians is that no decree or statue which the king established may be changed. And the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. 
And the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet, with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his, his palace and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. Here we have the conspirators. They don't come to Darius and burst in and then blurt out their case, do they? They're subtle. They're conniving. They come and they allude to this edict. Wasn't there something about an edict of no petitions for 30 days, O king? And they draw out an affirmation. The king asserts that, of course, this is the case after the laws of Medes and Persians. The king doesn't see anything coming at all, does he? And then they lay the blow. And it's all rather pathetic. This picture of the, the king, the emperor, the head of state of Persia. And it's all so pathetic. How he's, he's set before us. He's trapped in a situation that he created by his own sin. We'll have more on that in a moment. He's entangled. And so he's, he's distraught. You find he's very displeased with himself. He's in earnest to try to deliver him. We find in the verse 18, he's beside himself and so on. And yet, where's Daniel all the time? Daniel, there's no reference. Daniel is undoubtedly at peace. Daniel is left walking with God. He's left in that posture where we last saw him. Walking with the Lord. He's referred to as a captive. But he could never truly be a captive because he is a son of the King of Jehovah and a prophet of God. You know, no Christian can be truly captive can never be truly put in bondage. They can throw you in jail. They can put you in stocks. They can do all sorts of things to you. But the Bible says that you are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. That those whom Christ has set free are free indeed. And so you can never be a captive. You are a conqueror. And it's the same with Daniel. Despite all of this talk about captivity, he is indeed a, a, a captive, and he's, I mean, he's indeed a conqueror. And Jerusalem, the city toward which he was praying, is a symbol of the kingdom of God, which will never be destroyed. He is serving a king with a kingdom that can never be conquered, never has, is not, or will be, will be conquered. It is an indestructible kingdom. And so notice that these men come, and what's the focus of their attack? Well, they deride Daniel, verse 13. He is slave boy, a child of the captivity of Judah, the defeated, the broken, those who were laid in the dust. So he's deriding Daniel. They're deriding Daniel. They're also hostile because they come and they say, he disregards you, O king. He disregards you and your, and your decree. And so they try to make it personal, to build hostility, as it were. And then if that's not enough, they're going to hold his feet to the fire. They've laid the trap. The snare's been set. He has now uh, fallen prey to them. And they hold his feet to the fire and say, remember the legal requirements that are, you agreed to. This is the law of the Medes and the Persians. They shut, as it were, his escape hatch. And so where, where, where are we left? We're not, it's, in many ways, it's, we're so accustomed to this text that we miss the strangeness of it. Because from verse 16 and following, you would think, given the circumstances, all of the focus would be on Daniel. 
and there's hardly any focus on Daniel. Verses 16 and following, right through verse 20, all of the focus is on the king. Daniel's the one who's been confined to the, the lion's den. The king lives at, at ease in a palace. And yet all of the focus is on, the full focus is on the king, on a king who is in anguish. And so here's a king in anguish, no focus on the trauma to Daniel. We hear about the king's night. We hear nothing about Daniel's night. There's none of the details about what the lions were like, you know, how the hours were spent, you know, what the experience was like, what he felt, all the things that he went through, none of that. But we're given all of that with regards to the king. We know all the details. He couldn't eat. We're told that he wouldn't have any entertainment or or any music that was brought to him. We're told that he's sleepless. We're given all the details about the king. Again, as I said a moment ago, it's it's, it's striking because you you have his naivete, which is highlighted in verse 12 something of his compassion in verse 14, but then this utter helplessness. The king of Persia, helpless, weak, fledgling individual described in verses 16 to 20. Nothing of a divine monarch to be found here. It's as if Israel is being given a lesson. And we, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, We're being given a lesson that we've been taught to sing and we'll sing again. We sang earlier in the service. Don't put your trust in princes. Do you see this prince? A friend of Daniel? Don't put your trust in princes. You put your trust in the prince. Messiah the prince. The governor of the kings of of the earth. That's where our trust is. But there's, there's a few things I think we can glean from this. When you start with pride, if you start anything with vanity, anything with self-glory, what is self-pleasing, whatever you start in that condition will result in vexation. It'll always result vexations will follow. If you're interested in what's self-pleasing, what what's, what's, what's brings me glory, what's, what's proud, you will, having sown the wind, will reap the whirlwind. Pride comes before a fall. Let us walk low. Yeah, this is another thing about prayerfulness. It keeps us low before the Lord. Our spirits are kept low before the Lord, if we're, if we're earnest in habitual prayer. But likewise, along with pride, what you do thoughtlessly, you will often wish to undo a thousand times over. What you do thoughtlessly, not just proudly, you will wish to undo a thousand times over. Is there anyone here this evening who cannot say that? Many of us have, have lived it and felt it acutely, have we not? Things done thoughtlessly that we wish we could undo a thousand times un- un- over. The Lord tells us to ponder the path of our feet. We're to ponder the path of our feet. If we're walking with the Lord, before the Lord, God conscious, habitual in prayer, lowly, With wisdom and understanding, we are safe. But this king is not safe because he's been full of himself and he's been thoughtless. What kind of policy, what kind of civil government policy forbids the reversing of a bad law? Concocting a bunch of nonsense. The inability to reverse a bad law? Only pride could feed such nonsense. The king condemns the innocent knowingly. 
he knows that Daniel is innocent and he condemns him. You see the sheer wickedness of that, the injustice of that. Verse 17, we're told that he seals the den with his own ring and the ring of his Lord's. Right? This is to, no doubt, with some encouragement to ensure that it's not undone. It points us forward, and it has some resemblance, doesn't it, to events centuries later at Christ's tomb. You can read about it in Matthew 27, verses 62 to 66, where the Jews come and say to Pilate, now listen, this guy said that before all of this, he was going to rise again. And we need to make sure that the disciples don't come and steal him away and, and pull up this kind of scenario and create a stir. The tomb needs to be sealed. Right? And so governmental authority is, is, is used, as it were. Well, guess what? Rome's seal could not prevent the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Darius's signet could not prevent Daniel's deliverance, a form of resurrection, symbolically, if you will, out of this tomb of lions. He is indeed delivered. God will have it so. Why is it that he is delivered to destruction? What's the cause, children? In a word, What's in a phrase, what's the cause? Why is Daniel delivered to destruction? Because he worshiped God. He refused not to worship God. That is a very good reason for dying. Refusing not to worship God. There are those who will give up the worship of God with no threat of death. Do you see how far we are from where we ought to be? We ought to be unwilling to, to not worship God, even under the threat of death. The Lord tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Well, the king says to Daniel, listen, you are a man who, serve, who serves God continually. God will preserve you continually. Darius had a little bit of insight, didn't he, into the nature of Jehovah. He had learned something from Daniel's lips. What was true then is true this evening. Those who serve God continually, God will preserve continually. It's not to say that there aren't ever any martyrs. Every one of God's people are in God's hand, inscribed upon the palm of his hand. And he is upholding and keeping and directing. We are very safe in the path of duty. It is safe to be busy doing what the Lord has called us to do. And there is where there is no shame of the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ will have no shame of us. Matthew 10, confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. You ref deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father in heaven. Daniel confesses Jehovah, and the Lord is pleased to own Daniel. That brings us thirdly to delivered from destruction by the God of Daniel, delivered from destruction. Verses 19 to 28, Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. When he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel, and the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God, whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lions' mouths, and they have not hurt me, for as much as before him innocency was found in me. And also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. The king was, then was the king exceeding glad for him. He commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no manner of hurt was found upon him, because he believed in his God. 
And the king commanded, and they brought those men which had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives. And the lions had the mastery of them. And break all their bones in pieces wherever they came at the bottom of the den. Then King Darius wrote unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, and steadfast forever in his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be even unto the end. And he delivereth and rescueth, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and in earth, who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius, in the reign of Cyrus, the Persian, delivered from destruction. It's not the king of Persia. No, Daniel's God is the only one who can and the only one who will deliver him. God has set all of these things in order in order to set his own glory, the glory of his grace forward. Extenuating, horrible circumstances for God's people are the stage on which the glory of God's grace is displayed. God loves broken, afflicted, backward, difficult. The Lord loves these things as means through which to display the glory of his grace. Here's Darius, no food, no entertainment, no sleep. He's powerless, he's in despair. You know, it would be better, it was better on that night to be a child of faith in the lion's den than to be a king in your palace without faith. This is the testimony of Daniel, God whom you serve continually. He, he runs, he doesn't send a servant, he goes himself to the mouth in the morning. He waits to the earliest period and he goes himself with some expectation and hope and he cries out to him. Verses 21 and 22 are significant because they're the only words we hear from Daniel's mouth. The only thing that Daniel says in all of this is recorded in two verses. And so it's important to note them. Notice that the primary focus is not on Daniel. The primary focus, children, is not on these mean-looking lions or on the den that he spent the night in. The focus is on God. In the original language, the, it's emphatic. He says in verse 22, My God hath sent his angel. All of the emphasis is on God. And it has such an impression upon Darius that all of the emphasis in response is for Darius to speak about the God of Daniel. This is what is being brought to the fore. Daniel says, the God who owns me. My God, who is powerful, he has saved me. This the God who is compassionate and loving. The God who looks upon his people in all of our afflictions and difficulties with a love that we cannot comprehend in its depth. Daniel says, the Lord looked upon me as it were in love and compassion. He's brought me deliverance through his angel. He sent an angel to the three men in the, the, the den, uh, in the, in the uh, fiery furnace. And now the angel's presence is found with Daniel. An angel? Yes. A token of the presence of God. You know, some would say a Christophany, Christ himself, perhaps one like the Son of Man, God who we saw, Son of Man, in, in uh, the fiery furnace. The fact is, whether an angel or whether Christ, the point is God's presence. Daniel does not spend the night alone. He spends the night with an angel, and I believe that it is indeed an angel. The den is made a palace in that sense. Because here Daniel is comforted, just as an angel is sent to Christ to strengthen him after his temptation, an angel's descent has strengthened Daniel. 
And you know, the Bible speaks about the ministry of angels even in the New Testament, the end of Hebrews 1. They are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to God's people. The Lord's, the Lord's heavenly host serve him by serving us. And here this angel comes and he says, shuts the mouth of the lions. The power of God is greater than the Persians. The Persians could not deliver, but God could deliver Daniel. Notice that in Daniel's words, there's not a whiff of bitterness. No bitterness to the king is pathetic. No bitterness to the conspirators who plotted against him. No bitterness against God. No bitterness about the circumstances. There's a sweet delight in God himself. Andrew Gray, the covenanter, spoke about how delight is taken from God's people when there are either misapprehensions or misconstructions of God's excellent ways. If we, if we misunderstand them or misconstrue them, our delight is taken away. Here is Daniel, no bitterness against those who have done him harm. We're told in verse 23, because he believed in his God. And this was confirmed this past Sabbath, wasn't it? Hebrews 11, verse 33, by faith they shut the mouth of lions. He's delivered because he believed in his God. The faith you saw at the window on his knees in prayer is the faith that has been sustaining him his whole life. The faith that we saw in chapter 1 when he purposed in his heart not to defile himself with the king's meat. It is that faith which Reverend Ellis was preaching about this past Sabbath. He leaned heavily upon his God. I think it was Whitfield who said, George Whitfield, that God's servants are immortal, that they are immortal until their work is completed. You cannot kill God's people until all of their work is done. It's impossible. So it is with Daniel. Many ways in which we should reflect upon this. You know, we, we obviously are not looking, most of us, and none of us here this evening, looking at the prospects of immediately gazing into a hole with lions in it. But there is a different, another lion that we have to contend with on a daily basis. Bible says that the devil is like a roaring lion going about seeking whom he may devour. And that's upfront, personal. That's something that we have daily combat with. In that sense, we're being tossed into a lion's den day after day. But we're, we're reminded, are we not? Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. The greatest grand reversal is not what's found in Daniel 6 or other places, but as I said in the introduction, it's found in the cross. Christ conquered the powers of darkness, crushing the head of the serpent. And he, as the king, destroys all of his and our enemies. And we are therefore safe when we are with the Lord. You know, the, the devil watches, and there are times personally and as, a f as families and as a congregation where we may be more vulnerable than other times. But you know what? At all times, God is our refuge. And at all times, God is our deliverer. And at all times, we have his presence. And God defends and delivers his people. Jesus was vindicated at the resurrection openly, visibly. Daniel is vindicated of his innocency. He says so. I'm innocent. I haven't done anything against you or the Lord. O king. Nothing truly. Had he broken the law? Absolutely. He defied it flagrantly. Had he done anything sinful against God or the king? No. No. He says, I'm innocent. 
of these things. He says, for as much as before him innocence he was found in him, in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Well, what happens? Judgment falls on those who sought to destroy the kingdom of God. So those who sought to destroy the kingdom of God, those who dug the pit fell into it themselves. Those who set the snare were ensnared themselves. It's Haman all over again. We have dozens, dozens of, of examples of this all through the Bible. The Haman principle. They who designed the lion's den for God's people, the destruction of God's kingdom, they end up, their whole families, children, wives, everyone. You showed no mercy to Daniel, no mercy is shown to you. They're the ones who are destroyed. Interesting, because Persian law evidently was different than Jewish law. God's law in Deuteronomy 24, verse 16, says that a, a child couldn't be punished for the, the, the parent's sins. There are examples, extraordinary examples, in which, like with Achan, we see things, the Lord bringing down judgment upon the household. But ordinarily, in the normal course of civil life, it wouldn't have been the case. Here, the whole family is wiped out. Judgment is falling upon those who sought to destroy the kingdom of God. And the whole end of the chapter focuses on the God of Daniel, on the glory of God. It is the God of Daniel. At the end of chapter 2, at the end of chapter 3, at the end of chapter 4, and now once again at the end of chapter 6, it's almost identical. The chapters end extolling the glory of the God of heaven and calling upon the whole world to do so. And so it's, it's the end of chapter 6 is not only the closure, if you will, of chapter 6, it's actually closure of the whole section of Daniel, this whole section of the book. This whole section of Daniel is being closed on this note. What we'll sing about in a minute, Psalm 138, verses 4 and 5, all the kings and all the peoples of the earth are called upon to fear and praise the Lord, to submit to King Jesus. Here is Darius who had dishonored God, and now he is calling for him to be honored. He calls all nations. This is a Gentile telling all of the Gentiles in the whole world in the Old Testament to submit to King Jesus. You know, all of that, it's very vogue in some reform circles to say that obligations of the civil magistrate to King Jesus is an Old Testament Jewish thing. Very vogue. It's a truckload of nonsense. In the Old Testament itself, we have Gentiles serving Christ as king in their na national capacity. In the Old Testament itself. And so here is a Gentile calling upon other Gentiles to fear God. Now, he doesn't go on to say, love Jehovah, and certainly doesn't say anything about forsaking idols. And he refers to him as Daniel's God, not his own God. But nevertheless, there is a call for all of the nations to fear Jehovah. Isn't this astounding? If it wasn't so familiar, it would astound us more, I believe to see this grand reversal. The persecutor, like Paul, brought to be the promoter of true religion. Daniel, on the other hand, who is being persecuted, is brought in verse 28 to be prospered. This is the God of heaven, my friends. This is the God before whom we have gathered to worship this evening. This is the God whom we adore. He is the Lord and he changes not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Everything you see depicted about the glory of God's grace in this passage is as true this evening as it was millennia ago in Daniel 6. God's ways are not our ways, but his ways are glorious.
and his grace is made splendid. And so let us, like Daniel, believe in our God, trust in him, and to be found leaning upon him. Stand for prayer. Gracious God in heaven, we confess that you are the living and the true God. That you are the God who is steadfast and whose kingdom shall not be destroyed. Whose dominion shall not end. And we are little children coming, as it were, to our heavenly Father and praying, O God, increase our faith. And give us the spirit of grace and supplications. Make us a praying people, a people in dead earnest about Zion's cause and the advance of your kingdom. Give us, O Lord, ability to trust you, that you love to bring about a grand reversal to set forth the glory of your grace, that you do all things well, and that in the least expected places and with the least expected people and through the the least expected means, you show yourself strong. Glorify yourself among us, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing together Psalm 138, verses 4 to 7. Psalm 138, verses 4 to 7. Tune is Lancaster, number 80. Tune number 80. All kings upon the earth that are shall give thee praise, O Lord, when as they from thy mouth shall hear thy true and faithful word. This is not only seen in Darius, my friends, it will be seen in the end. Every king will confess. Notice verse 7 as well. Though I in midst of trouble walk, I life from thee shall have. Against my foe's wrath thou stretch thine hand. Thy right hand shall me save. Sing verses 4 to 7.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. Amen.